Welcome to another edition of Hit the Lights Plus. Uh, I've obviously got Peter Arrow with me here. Um, we're going to be carrying on part two of our electrical installation condition report review for landlord inspections. So I think we were up to section 13, weren't we? We were indeed, just before the inspection schedule starts. Let's crack on then. Let's do it. All right, so item number one, subcategory, is the external condition of intake equipment which is the visual inspection only. So I happen to know that the intake equipment was directly below, slightly to the side of the consumer unit, but fully accessible. So service cable, not applicable. Why? Because it's a limitation. And then so goes on for the service head, the earthing arrangement, which is interesting because if that was a limitation, how was he confirmed it was a TNS? How's he also taken a ZE? Exactly. So we have a limitation earthing arrangement with perhaps made up. See, all I can think is, has he done a ZSDB and then based it because it's higher than 0.35 and less than 0.8. So he's assumed it's a TNS. Or has he just looked at the end date and thought, I'm not bothering with that. It's a TNS. I don't know. That'd be a question for him, really. It's a long list of questions we have. Yeah, if we ever find this guy. <laughs> a lot of ones are going to begin with why. <laughs> All right, so, I mean, let's back on to the point. We can probably cover, sec- do it section by section. So section one, intake, we've only got a tick on the meter tails, even though he's obviously completed some testing. He's put limitation against an isolator. There is an isolator. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, what what was he thinking and, and why? We don't obviously won't know that, but we'll, we can just simply state he got it wrong. Annoyingly, there is a comment section which he hasn't made use of. I can see further down he has wrote comments in, so why not write comments up there? Well, yeah. Remains to be seen. Right, okay, then let's move on. Earthing and bonding arrangements. So the first one is presence and condition of distributors' earthing arrangement. And he's ticked that. How? Because he's done the work. Yeah, but if, he's, if it's limited above, then how is it a tick here? Yeah, he's I mean, dr- it's driving me to drink this bloke. <laughs> well, um, I mean, it's obviously cross cross information here, and I think it's a case of either he doesn't understand what these ticks box mean, or he doesn't understand the remit of what he's trying to achieve. I'd go along with that. I think that's the most polite way of doing it. So let's agree to move on. Yeah, go on. Then. Okay, well then the next one, Earth electrode. We don't know if there's an earth electrode or not because he hasn't inspected the incomer. Um, He's happy that there's labels everywhere. And to be honest, so was I. Confirmation of the earthing conductor size. So I'm assuming he's seen that come into the consumer unit as a 16. How does he know it's continuous? Well, because he's done this strange ZS test. But he doesn't, you know, he's not actually achieved that at all. Um accessibility and condition of earthing conductor at MET. So what would we be looking for there? Probably you would have seen worse cases in your industry than mine. What are you alluding to? Well, if we've got the... Which one are we on? (laughs) There you go, sorry. Condition, that's the one. The accessibility and condition of the earthing conductor. So obviously you can either get to it or you can't. That's pretty straightforward. But what about the condition? What would you be looking for? I'd just be looking for adequate termination, really. Yeah. What about the sheathing? Well, yeah, that, that forms part of it. Obviously, if it's identified, if it's uh, suitably supported throughout clipping or whatever like that. Yeah, fair enough. And do you actually know the percentage difference between the green and yellow? I'm going to say 70-30 or something like that. Yeah, 70-30. No. Um, okay, so confirmation of main protective bond, protective bonding conductors. So that's basically saying that we've assessed them, we've measured them, we're happy they're connected suitably, no corrosion on the clamps, um, probably connected within 600 mil of incomer where possible, mm-hmm. or any T's and bends and such like. Do we? I mean, we don't even know if there's potentially any PVC entering in, do we? I think it's all pretty extraneous old. coming in, yeah. yeah. 
And then we've got accessibility and condition of other protective bonding connections, which is not applicable. But does he really know that if he hasn't got the previous certificate? Because sure, you'd need to know if there's any bonds to expose steel work or... You're not going to have exposed steel work typically in a house, are you? I, I think I would anticipate, I would interpret that as being potentially like, you know, supplementary bonding of pipe work in maybe a boiler cupboard or something. Yeah. Um, okay. But if he if he's like, if he's not gone in the loft, typically that's probably where most boilers are going to be or something of that nature, aren't they? Um, yeah. He, he won't have been able to view that, so I would have, almost potentially say that limitation I would like to see there. Yeah, limitation or further investigation. Yeah. I'd have FI'd it. If I couldn't get in the loft for some accessible reason, I'd have said I need to investigate that further. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Okay, because obviously in the price, we haven't priced for a scaffold to get up into the loft or whatever else. So that's it. That's, it. that's, that's why we're further investigating it. Why not? Um, right, next section, consumer unit distribution boards. So adequacy of working space, the consumer unit. And I think that's industry guidance is one metre in front of the consumer unit. I can't remember. I remember maintenance and gangways. That's your favourite. I was that the other day. Yeah. 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 So maintenance and gangways, I think, is 700 mil. Right. Okay. From, from, from worst case position. So I would always assume that to be door open. Now I could be going, I could be way off the mark here because this isn't a maintenance gangway. Is it? No, I just vaguely remember, and I think it was in perhaps an NIC EIC guidance pamphlet or something. But in front of your consumer unit, you should have one meter space, which that raises the question for a lot of understairs cupboards, boards. But yeah. those guidance is guidance, isn't it? So in this particular installation, you'd agree that it's got it? It's in a garage. There's loads of room. I could probably do a cartwheel in there. I doubt you could do a cartwheel. but I could do a cartwheel. We could we can tick this box. <laughs> the cartwheel box. <laughs> so, all right. Right, so we've got security of fixing. So is it hanging off the wall? Could I pull it off the wall? Is it wobbly? No, it's good. Security of fixing. You would interpret that as only the fixings to the wall? What other ones? Well, he's mentioned about the cover. Yeah. So, 134.1.1. Good workmanship by one or more skilled or instructed persons and proper materials shall be used in the erection of the installation. The installation equipment shall take account of manufacturer's instructions. So, yeah, manufacturer's instructions probably say two screws. Yep. However, it depends on how you read fixing, because to me, fixing is fixing it to the wall. Whereas the lid is a barrier. It would be considered a barrier, but it requires a fixing. Reading the letter of the law. No, that's fair enough. I, I don't have a problem with that. And I'd probably agree with you, actually. OK. All right. So the next two are probably the most or three are the most pertinent to uh, the issue we've been discussing and some of the stuff he's highlighted in the observations being condition in terms of IP rating conditions in terms of fire rating and enclosure not damaged or deteriorated so he's for me he's put c2 against ip rating so isn't this contrary to what he put earlier in the report no i think he put ip was c2 but fire rated was c3 or was it the other way around so that no you're right he did put ip as c2 and that c3 so he's been consistent at least with on this on this, yeah, um, with what he's actually detailed through from his observations. I think on this specific software, however, it does create that other page. So on the inspections, when you say C2, it automatically chucks it across into that other page. Right, OK. OK, so that's, that's a fairly but useful tool. Neither here nor there, but it does also say on there, there's location and other stuff, but it doesn't really say why all we've got is IP rating for consumer unit is not met. Is it on the top? Is it on the sides? Is it the back, the front? The We don't know. But it's a C2. So we'd assume it isn't a blank or anything at the bottom that you could literally touch a live part. So we're assuming that. So fire rated then, the next one. Consumer unit, not fire rated, C3. Fine. Fine by me on that one. Taking that one. Okay. And then for the enclosure not damaged, deteriorated so as to impair safety, 
consumer unit missing one screw for cover. C3. That's a two for me. I'd have to have a better look at it. But yeah, two. Okay. It's working at 50% of its efficiency. Yep. So, yeah, I'd agree with that. Particularly in a garage, I'm assuming it's potentially subject to damage quite easily. Yeah, it's probably a bit higher than head height. Probably maybe two metres off the ground, so you're not likely right. to drive a car into it. But if you've got your blinds in there or whatever, <laughs> carrying, carrying your... Uh, so you know what, I'm always I'm always carrying blinds around a garage. I don't know what you do. Just trying to think of rubbish that you have in your garage. When you put your kayak or your canoe away, you swing around with your oar and knock your consumer unit off the wall. <laughs> okay. So then we get on to a fair few ticks from him. So we've got operation of main switch, so fine. Um he's put manual operation of circuit breakers and RCDs to prove disconnection. Now, I will very quickly jump down to his circuits, but if we've got circuits that he hasn't tested with limitation against end of lines and ZSs, then it's a further investigation. Yeah, there's no way that he can be ticking that box. No, no, I agree completely. And how would you do it? Because for me, I would go earth to the line on turn it off wait for no voltage then i would go neutral to the line and verify it as what the same way so i mean if he's not if he's not uh isolated the circuit he can't tick that box no i'm happy to go with that simple as that so that'll be a further investigation Mm -hmm. okay so then we've got correct identification of circuit details and protective devices again he's not put on his schedules any number of points or anything so he, to me he's not verified any of the identifications on a lot of the circuits well this is what confuses me because i know there is two a4 pages in a lovely little um photo frame next to the consumer unit which says all the points all their details number of um if they've got an rcd on it and everything and is he ticking for that or not because I know it's there, but then why didn't he put the points down? Is it because he just did not see it, or is it because he was in such a hurry he didn't write it down? Yeah, potentially. E- either way, it's what's on this documentation for me, not that it's historical information somewhere else. He had to verify that what was in that chart was correct, mm-hmm. and that's what should have made its way onto this certificate. Yeah, I agree. So, again, uh, an incorrect tick. Um, and then we're, we're getting into basic labelling. So, presence of RCD, six monthly test notice, um, tick. Then we've got kind of got contradictory information here because he's saying presence of non standard cable colour warning notice. Yet he's stated the installation to be 30 years old. This is, yeah, this is the point I needed it on the last podcast. Because he's saying not applicable. And we're going to assume now, but we're going to assume it's all in one colour. Yeah. So it's either all red and black or it's all blue and brown. And I know that the tails are blue and brown. So therefore, he's either wrong in what he's saying there or, well, he can only be wrong, can't he? He's got no <laughs> or option. he's right. It's either wrong or yeah. right. He's not right, is he? He's no. wrong on that or yeah. he's wrong on 30 years. So that's, an, that's another another issue. Yeah, OK. Um, Okay, so we've not got any alternative supplies. and So here's another one for you. Presence of other required labelling. Now, is there any other sorts of labels you would typically install on a distribution board? Um, normally, smoke detectors, if I'd installed them, number, location, that you sort of stuff. you put that on the consumer unit? I would, yeah. I know the um, ones I use, I use the ACO ones. They come with a little sticker ready to go on. I'd also name the consumer unit db1 db2 Mm -hmm. designation i put down any specific information like no cpcs on lighting circuits class two fittings only obviously that doesn't apply for this installation but just generally speaking and um, any specific manufacturer's instructions i would append or label the consumer unit with okay i mean that's those are all sound like good practice things um 
I think so. Typically, you're going to come across uh, your RCD test label, aren't you? You're going to yeah. come across your harmonization label, uh, your next inspection report. Um, so, I mean, we're already filling up the board with quite a lot of labels, aren't we? Typically, I always put a voltage warning label. Yeah, I did the same. Um, on there. So, uh, whilst it may be that, okay, as a minimum requirement, of the, what we're saying might be preference, potentially, I think I would always anticipate seeing a voltage label as a warning and a potentially something that's say, stated about you know, non-instructed persons opening yeah. the cover and such, or, you know, ensure isolation before removing cover, those sorts well, of... Also. There's another contradiction there, which I've just found, which is date of last inspection, not applicable, but then he's ticked the previous inspection labels. What point are you looking at again, sorry? Where it says presence of other required labelling, please specify. Yeah. So 4.13. Up here... On page one, it says date of last inspection, but surely that should have had a sticker on that says this is when I inspected it and this is when it needs to be inspected. So I would note that there. Yep. So I, I was, yeah, that basically. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Okay. Um, so then we we said we would kind of gloss over the next one, but we've got compatibility of protective devices. Have I come gone back a bit? No, no, you're in the right place. No, sorry, yeah. So compatibility of protective devices, bases and other components, um, correct type and rating. Um, so he's put incorrect MCB rating for ring, 20 amps, and radial, 32 amps. Yeah, and he's referenced a few, it's obviously DB1, circuit 10 and circuit 12, but I happen to know it's a 32 amp MCB with a 4 mil radial which feeds the adjoining utility room, I think, and it's a 20-amp ring. So what's wrong with a 20-amp ring? So nothing wrong with a 20-amp ring, um, as we well know. Um, we've, so we're saying, sorry, circuit 14, was it, he said, or U12? DB1, 10, and 12. So 12 being the utility radial. So he's got it as a utility radial, a 2.5 two five cpc twin and earth so that's wrong in itself before yeah. we get there and it's but, a four mil 1.5 in reality so it's you, you believe it to be a four one five yeah so again we've got some contradictory information here then um about conductor sizing so that he's, he's actually do you think it's a case he's not looked at the conductor sizing because I don't know what he's done because I've never heard of a 2.5, 2.5 T and E or a 1.5, 1.5 T and E. In fact, looking at it, the only one I see he's got right is the 6 mil 2.5 T and E. Mm. Otherwise, all of the um, live conductors match the CPC. Okay. Apart from in a 1 mil, obviously. Better say that. Yeah. So, all right. So, we'll we'll come back to that then when we get onto the the board schedule. If we go back to our inspections. Yep. Um, so we're into 4.15, number 14. So single pole switching and protective devices in line conductor only. So, I mean, that's a fairly self-explanatory, you'd hope. Protection against mechanical damage where cables enter consumer unit. It's a plastic um, board, so not going to be yeah. too heavy on the mechanical damage, but yeah, still an appropriate glands and suitable grommets and stuff. Yeah. Um, protection against electromagnetic effects. Well, yeah, so that should be fairly self-explanatory. Then we've got RCDs provided for fault protection. He's ticked. So now we're thinking it's a TT system. So why would you think it was a TT? Well, it could be on a TN, but more than likely you'd assume a TT because if it's Basically, the um, RCD is there for fault protection over additional protection. So it's gone above its ZS as per the regs. So you're then using the RCD for your ADS. Yep. So he's obviously ticked that. What do you think he thinks he means? I think he thinks he thinks that there's an RCD, so I'll tick that. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think the, the key thing is... On some of the circuits, I think we've seen on the schedule that not all circuits are high, are protected by RCD, and he's even flagged it. Exactly. On one of his observations. So not only has he then ticked it, he's then cut, coded it. 
It's the gift that keeps on giving. It, it, it is. So he's, I mean, he's going round and round. Um, so we'll, we'll move on from that one. Um, confirmation of indication that SPD is functional. So he's just so, put NA. Yeah, but there isn't one well, there, is there? No. So there should be some consideration. I'd put it in the comments personally. Depends how pernickety you want to be. But yeah, fair enough. Not applicable. There isn't one. Comments. Um, should there be one? So for me, I would say C3. I would have buy it. Pardon? Or would I? I would call it a C3. So unless somebody can demonstrate that an assessment has been done to not have one, I would I would want to see one there. It wasn't required at the time, but it is required now, so I would put it as a C3. Yeah, fair enough. I'd probably comment somewhere. But then there would be no requirement, potentially, as part of the remedials to capture it. Would you want to see signs of damage, though? But then it'd be a C2, I suppose, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I, it's purely that there isn't there isn't one there. I'm expecting to see one. Based on its age, I get that it won't have had one. But the recommendation is to have one, unless you can show me a risk assessment that proves you don't need one, or the customer has got a piece of paper stating they don't want one. So that's why I'd be more inclined to further investigate it, because then the report is unsatisfactory until it had been carried out. Is the C3 unsatisfactory? No. So um, why not C3? Because you can forget, a C3 is an advisory, isn't it? A lot of people yeah. think, well, well, poo your C3, it's, I don't care. But an FI is unsatisfactory, so you have to do something about it. But you, there's, I mean, for me, that's probably maybe a technical thing then of the wording, that further investigation, what are you further investigating? The risk, whether I need a SPD. Yeah, okay, I'll go with that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Again, yeah, fine. Le- everyone's going to do these things way. differently, and all we're doing is discussing our opinions, and that's all they are at the end of the day. But yeah. I would FI it because I'd want to see that risk accounted for. Nailing it home, aren't you? I'll make sure it's there. <laughs> you got that, Gary? <laughs> Um, so next one, um, confirmation that all conductor connections, including connections to buzz bars, are correctly located in terminals and are tight and secure. How would he know? He hasn't switched any of it off. No, I oh know. That's the little dentist mirror out. Have a little check. Then you get your torque driver out. Google the manufacturer's instructions. Talk the lot up, as you should do when you remove a cover anyway. Before yep. you put that cover back on, apart from putting the buzz bar cover back on, which no one ever remembers the first time round, but talk everything up. You've had it off. Things come loose over time. You were the last one there. Cover your bum. Make sure you're safe. So I go on to section five then, final circuits. Lots of nice ticks in this. So it'd be interesting to see how he's captured all these circuits he hasn't tested. Um, the final circuits with lots of ticks. Um, but anyway, so we'll move on. So identification of conductors. All he's verified is what's at the board. Basically, yeah. And apparently 10% of other stuff, but we don't know what 10%. Yeah. Um, so, wrong. Yeah. Happy to um, say that. Wrong. Cables correctly supported throughout their run. Well, he didn't go in the loft for a start, so he hasn't seen yeah. 50% of the... How? How does he know that? Yeah. So, again, we'll... Yeah, no. No, uh, condition of insulation of live parts. He's put further investigation. Wow, there's a lot of circuits there. DB1, C9, 12, 14, and 16. So a lot of those were the ring circuits for study and bits and pieces, weren't they? Um, well, it's even the oven. No, it's not. I can't read. DB9. Yeah, strange. Strange guy. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> so all right so he's put further investigation against that i don't think i can really disagree with that in the sense that i know he hasn't tested and looked at this stuff so i just you get, want, again i want more words why yeah yeah you want more detail as to why what's given him that suspicion that further investigation is needed this next one winds me up 
non-sheath cables protected by enclosure in conduit ducting or trunking and then the next one to include the integrity of conduit and trunking systems metallic and plastic he's ticked both of them is there any uh, pvc trunking anywhere in the property but it's non-sheathed so it'd be singles yeah there's not no singles everything's pvc pvc okay so why has he ticked it yeah well, don't know ask him why again <laughs> Okay, so let's let's not get drawn into these too much because there's obviously quite a lot yeah. wrong with these no. ones. Okay, that's fine. Um, so accuracy of cables for current carrying capacity with regard to the type and nature of installation. Now he's already flagged that he thinks it's a two five on a thirty two. So what's he done he's, tick- he's ticked it. He's ticked it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So yeah. again, he's not even consistent with his own information. That he's uh, his story. So next one, um, coordination between conductors and overload. Again, same fucking issue. He's ticked it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All right, so 5.7 is adequacy of protective devices, type and rated current for fault protection. So ADS, providing the ZS is okay, then we're happy. Presence and adequacy of CPCs. And that's a tick. And the last tick on this one is wiring systems appropriate for the type and nature of the installation and external influences. But didn't he do some with the 50 mil? So he said that he's not happy with no RCDs because it's less than 50 mil. But if there's no RCDs, then it should be more than 50 mil to make the wiring systems okay. I agree. And then he's he's noted in 5.10, cables concealed in prescribed zones. Limb. It's fair enough. But how does he know? How does he know he doesn't know? But in reference to 5.9 and the depth when we were talking about that. Yeah, no. I'm, how, I agree. How, how do you know it's not deep enough if you don't know where it is? That's a fair comment. Yeah. You don't. So really, should 5.9 be a limb then? I would say so. Okay. And then he's obviously limbed 5.11 as well. Cables concealed under floors, ceilings and in walls. Limb. So I, I would have probably have put further investigation against those. How would you carry out that work? Um, it's one of those where I would probably have to go. You'd end up going into the loft. You'd end up lifting a few floorboards to inspect an area, wouldn't you? What you'd say further investigation because he hasn't inspected under floors or in the loft space to give you enough confidence that certain criteria has been met yeah okay i think the fact that he's kind of initially challenging the depth would make me want to look a bit deeper into it yeah okay fair enough not that any of this gives me confidence no no this um almost feels too easy yeah in a not trying to be a nasty person sort of way but there's definitely a lot wrong with this all right, so we're into 5.12 um, RCD protection. Um, so he's put for all socket outlets, um, unless permitted under 411. So he's ticked that. I don't, I, I don't know the schedule well enough, but I'm no, assuming. No, I'm that. pretty sure there is a cooker outlet, play, uh, cooker panel switch, sorry, the one with a socket on it. So that isn't. Is, so that would need to be RCD protected because there's a socket on it. Yeah, no, sorry, I'm saying that isn't RCD protected. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah that'd be right. Okay. Um, so for that reason alone, I'd probably comment on that, say, um, yeah, probably C2 then, because it's in the kitchen and near the garden. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So, yeah, I'd just comment on it saying only on the cooker circuit, so they knew it wasn't much to fix, really, get an RCBO out. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Then he's put for the supply of mobile equipment not exceeding 32 amp rating for use outdoors. Back to the point I just made, really, about the cooker outlet. Sorry, the cooker panel switch. Mm. Do you think that maybe it's being overly harsh to give all of the installation a C2 because one cooker socket wasn't Well, that's out? why you have comments, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, you've got them, so use them. I'm not C2 in the hole, but I'm C2 in the installation because in a certain position, it does not have RCD protection where required. Do you, would you, what I'm kind of driving at is would you factor in 
the, the amount of risk associated with that socket. So say that socket and the kitchen is hypothetical. I don't know the layout of the house, but it's fairly central to the house. So it backs area. onto the garden because it does. <laughs> All right, we'll say it backs onto the garden and it's right out by the window. Yeah. Then I'd agree. Okay. But what about in the scenario it's in the centre of the house? Well, people can still run extension leads, can't they? The way I see it is you're looking at do, but why, minimal why cost I'm... to update one cooker circuit to an RCD protection. So Yeah, that's fine. I'm just wondering if any level of risk is there. Yeah, you'd, you'd allow for that, wouldn't you? I know recently in commercial installs and industrial stuff, you didn't need RCD protection. But the way I see it is it's a domestic installation and... Probably not the nicest thing to say, but people can be idiots. You know, we, we make mistakes. I make thousands every day. <laughs> like the green to come on podcasts with people. But I wouldn't like yeah. it. And if I was the landlord, I would rather have RCD protection on it than not. Right. So we'll move on to number 15. So we're on 5.13 now. Um, provision of fire barriers, ceiling arrangements, and protection against thermal effects. So he's put limitation against this one. What do you reckon? I would prefer to actually look because... Okay, so he said already he hasn't taken down any downlights or recessed luminaires. But if you don't want to damage the fabric, you can easily take out the lamp. People, as a maintenance point of view, have to take out lamps and change them. We're assuming they're not going to be integral because we know it's 15 years old and he thinks it's 30 years old and we didn't really have that sort of technology back then. So we're going to be looking at a halogen downlight. So why can't you just spin out the middle of it and have a look through that if it's got a fire hood or an intrusent seal or some sort of protection? Mm. I mean, it's certainly better than nothing. Um I would say I wouldn't say it's necessarily foolproof, but it's um, certainly better than nothing. No, but It'll give you at least an indication. I'm just saying it's he's had to do a ZS surely at the end of one of his lighting circuits. Well, you so, think so? But so how's he done that without inspecting the fire barrier? You would suggest so, but I think on all of his lighting circuits, he's not actually tested. So that would be why. Yet. But okay. <laughs> Well, I can't answer that one then, so we might as well just move on. Agree yeah, sure. It's wrong. Um, I mean, he's put band two and band one cables segregated, um, cables segregated from comms cables, and cables segregated from non-electrical services as NA. So, so uh, what I can derive from that is that there's no cabling under 50 volts, there's no BT cabling or anything similar, and there's no pipes or gas or anything that isn't electrics in the building. That's what I would get from that. So because clearly, it's not applicable, so obviously it's not there. Yeah, um, but obviously we know there is gas and we know there is water. So again, another another issue. Another yeah issue. Okay, terminations at enclosures based on the extent of sampling of ten percent. Mm. Oh, and we have a code, so this will be exciting. Yeah. So go on then. So just start at the top. Connections soundly made and under no underuse strain, tick. But already, he's already said elsewhere that there's basic insulation or there's issues. Mm. So surely that contradicts that one. Then yep. the next one, definitely, no basic insulation of a conductor visible outside the enclosure. Connections of live conductors adequately exposed, which again contradicts what he said, and adequ- adequately connected at point of entry and enclosure. Sorry, two enclosure, which I don't know where that would be. Probably the sub-main in a armoured. Now on to the code, which is condition of accessories, including socket outlets, switches and joint boxes. Now, I actually quite like this inspection because not a lot of people actually comment on the condition of accessories. It's always about the cabling and the infrastructure, but never about the the actual faceplates. No one ever says, oh, we recommend you change all the faceplates in a house. What would be a reasoning for changing? Just age. If you've got an old house, you know, it's it still deteriorates, doesn't it? I've been to places, and I think we've actually got um, the old-style sockets where you haven't got the earth pin that affects the shutters. Mm-hmm. So 
that, that needs updating. And I have had that before and I've coded it and I've been back to update the, upgrade the sockets. So what age do you think potentially that you would give for that condition to actually deteriorate for an accessory? It depends what you buy, didn't you? You know, you can buy top quality stuff or you can buy poor stuff. It's like anything. It depends on its use. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. You know, if, is it in a kitchen or is it in a hallway? It's the subject. Enough. You know, if it's in a kitchen, you're cooking, you get all your oil splashed up the back of it and that. It's If you go there, and I've had it before, and you look at a socket and you think, that's just stuck to the wall. That is just grease. Mm. So that needs changing, doesn't it? That's It's dangerous. But yeah, yeah, for that one, he's put DSSO Entrice can't plug in. So I'm assuming there's a socket in the entrance hall that he can't plug in for whatever reason. And that's a C2. Why is it dangerous if you can't plug something in? I mean, if it's damaged to the point of not being out, if it's like chipped. The point I'm the trying point. to make is it's not enough information. I would agree. If, you know... As in this instance, someone else was giving the report to Price Remedials and he said to me, well, what do I, just what, basically? I said, well, I don't know. I'm assuming you've got to change the socket, but you don't know that. It could mean other things. Mm. And how urgent is it? Is it literally the neutrals burning and it it's, needs doing like now, now? Or is a bit of plastic snapped somewhere and it's you just can't plug into it? Yeah, it needs more information. I, I would have thought it should have been classified in or detailed as an observation. Yeah. yeah I don't recall seeing anything as, associated with any accessories, so suddenly we've got a C2 appearing out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, they were vague, but I don't recall one that would necessarily relate to that too easily. Yeah. But okay. No, no, right, moving on then. So we've got suitability of accessories for external influences. Tick. Can't say much more beyond that, to be honest. No. Um, adequacy of working space, accessibility to equipment, he's ticked. And single pole switching or protective devices, inline conductors only, which is a tick. So no problem with any of that. Yeah, fine. I would argue that if he's um, done limitation, not tested anything, how does he know, particularly on the lighting? Yeah, obviously on the dead tests when you're doing an R1, R2, you should operate all the switches to make sure just that. Yeah, um, so I would I would suggest that that would need a further investigation. So number six, we've got locations containing bath or shower. Um, so we've got additional protection for all low voltage circuits by RCD, and we've got a tick. Yeah, no RCD on the lights. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, nice big fat fucking tick on that one. Um, anyway, so moving on. Um, where used as a protective measure, requirements for salve or pelve are met? No, no, no salve expected in a bathroom. Maybe cabinet lighting or something, but I don't think there is in this particular installation, so not applicable. And then we've got number 6.3, shaver sockets to comply with um, formerly BS3535. He's ticked. Obviously, I can't really contradict that. Um, presence of supplementary bonding conductors. Yeah, there was an issue earlier that he hasn't ticked the bonding correctly. Correct, yeah. So, again, we've got an issue with that. So, I'd like to know that. I'd actually like to know in the comments what he's tested, what the results were, and what his calculation was to approve satisfaction. I don't know. Maybe I'm asking too much. I don't think so. I don't think so. He's putting contradictory information in here all over the place and consistency would matter. Um, then we've got presence of, sorry, no, I've just read that, read that one. Um, low voltage socket outlets sighted at least three metres from zone one. He's got his NA. Right, so it's suitability of equipment for external influences for installed in location in terms of IP rating. So he's put a tick. Can't really comment. Yeah, it's an yeah. IP rated fitting. I think it's a baton holder or a you know bathroom rated fitting. So yeah, okay. So and then the next one is suitability of accessories and control gear for a particular zone. Not applicable. Yeah. So accessories and control gear. So assuming the switch is outside, not in the zone. So yeah, okay. So we'll leave that one then. Um, suitability of current using equipment for particular position within the location. We've got a tick. 
what? Yeah. So I, I would suggest if he's got current using equipment within the location, one of those other items should be ticked. So either we should have suitability of accessories or potentially we, we're going to be looking at what sockets, unless he's just referring to the shaver socket, potentially. Well, yeah, you'd assume so. I mean, yeah, maybe because it's an accessory. So, yeah, OK, I'll have a tick. I'll go with it. So I think it's probably about time we call this this one on here um, before we move on to the schedules of uh, test results. Obviously, we'll catch up on the next podcast and go from there. Yep. So, um, schedule of test results. So, yeah, bring it on. All right. Thanks for listening.